an amplification of a principle in Galatians chapter 5. Where we are studying the trends of the old sin nature. Take the things which we study this morning and make them a source of information on which we can advance spiritually as we apply these things to our individual lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Looking at now the uh, next point of the doctrine of the old sin nature, which we have been contemplating for a bit now under the principle of Romans chapter 6, we come to uh, uh, Roman numeral uh, five, four, five, six, I guess it is, and that is the struggle with the old sin nature. And under the principle of the struggle with the old sin nature, we're going to take some time to look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is uh, one of the most fascinating and thrilling passages in the Word of God. And the book of Galatians was the first of the Apostles' letters, the first written the earliest of his epistles. And it demonstrates what it means to be free, first of all, from the penalty of sin, as we have already discussed, that the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, first of all, gives us freedom from the penalty of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For Jesus Christ died for our sin. But we also realized from Romans chapter 6, verse 10, that Christ died unto the old sin nature, which delivers us from the power of the old sin nature, whereby we are given the ability to glorify God in time. Eventually, we will be delivered from the very presence of sin. Now, in the book of Galatians, he begins by uh, the principle that we are saved by grace. Then he goes on with the, the concept uh, which is found in Galatians 3, 1, in which he says, You foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Finished work of Christ. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you have heard? And then here's the question. Verse 3, are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? It's a rhetorical question which demands a negative answer. And so he's going to point out that, yes, you were saved by grace, and you live by means of grace. Now, what was happening was that when the Apostle Paul left the Galatian churches, uh, the church of Antioch, uh, Derby, Lystra, Iconium. When he left the area, the Judaizers, the legalizers came in and said, oh yes, you're saved by grace. But, and always that three-letter word, but. But if you want to be spiritual, you must receive the rite of circumcision. And the Apostle Paul uh, has to deal with that in the first of his letters. And really, the, uh, the, uh, the book of Galatians is one of the most magnificent 
polemics on the whole subject of the grace of God that you'll ever read anywhere. Romans is the most excellent uh, delineation uh, as far as its uh, layout uh, of uh, uh, the uh, work of uh, justification and sanctification. But Galatians is the grace book, and it is absolutely tremendous. By the time he comes to the end of the fourth chapter, he's dealing with, he, he is beginning to introduce the conflict which is consistently going on. And the illustration of that conflict is, uh, goes all the way back to the tents of Abraham. And uh, uh, we find that uh, Abraham, at the time of, of the illustration, has uh, literally has two wives. The wife of promise, which is the wife of grace, is uh, uh, his uh, beautiful and uh, lovely wife, the one to whom he, uh, who he really loved, Sarah, but with whom he had no children. And then we have the wife of legalism, which is Hagar, and uh, by whom... He had Ishmael. Eventually, God gave him Isaac, or Yitzhak, from Sarah. And so he uh, uses this, and he makes it very clear in verse 24 of the, fifth, uh, of the uh, fourth chapter. This is an allegory, he, and he's telling us that he is using an allegory. In fact, the Greek word is allegorizo, allegorizo, which is transliterated into the English, and it really means to be taken figuratively. Uh, all allegories are to be taken figuratively. The problem with covenant theology is that they take almost everything in Scripture figuratively. Uh, only dispensational theology uh, believes in the literal interpretation of Scripture uh, and allows for figures of speech as the Word of God makes it very clear. But in verse 24... Uh, of, uh, of the fourth chapter, he says, there is an allegory. And then he goes on to explain the two. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are slaves. This is Hagar. So here you have uh, the slave mentality, the slave operation. Then uh, he says in verse 25, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai. And what, is, what came from Mount Sinai? The Mosaic Law. So he brings, he's using this in an allegorical uh, teaching. And, uh, uh, and it, could, it corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem was the center of legalism. And so you, it goes all the way back, and he makes it very clear uh, that this is an allegory of legalism versus grace. But the Jerusalem that is above, verse 26 says, is free. Now, this, the, uh, you see, legalism brings one into uh, slavery or bondage. Here is the true freedom, he says. Uh, uh, for it is written, uh, and then he quotes from Isaiah 54, 1. Now, verse 28. Now, you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. Children of promise, children of grace. Uh, at that time, the son born in the ordinary way, that's Ishmael, persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit, Isaac. Uh, and uh, uh, he says, uh, it is the same now, or so it is uh, currently. It is uh, going on. That is, the, uh, the legalism will always persecute uh, the uh, uh, grace. It will, there will always be a controversy uh, therein. But what's that the scripture, verse 30? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Now, he has used one word several times uh, as he has talked about the matter of freedom. And uh, it looks like this in the Greek. Uh, that's the substantive form, E-L-E-U-T-H-E-R-I-A. And the verb form, 
L E U T H E R E O. Just the ending is different. Uh, Eleutereo. And it is the translation of the word for freedom. Now, remember that there are no chapter divisions in the original. Now he goes on and he says in chapter 5, verse 1, uh, well, we'll take it, uh, uh, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Uh, we begin with the dative singular of the definite article. Now, there, the dative case is extremely important because the dative case designates that to which anything is represented as accruing. And the verse begins with the, the dative of the, uh, the definite article. So we are looking at a, a word, uh, while it, it to simply, uh, we would say the, the definite article is the. But in the Greek, the case makes it say some different things depending on how it is used. In the dative case, it says, would be, say, for the purpose of, or uh, this is the object, for the objective. It indicates that uh, to which anything is represented as accruing. And then we have the first usage uh, of uh, the word eleutheria. Uh, and uh, so he, he is indicating for the objective or for the purpose of freedom. And then we have the uh, intensive uh, uh, personal pronoun, humes, which looks like this, H-U-M-E-I-S, uh, in the accusative plural, and uh, it refers to uh, believers uh, of any dispensation. And so he begins uh, uh, by saying, for the purpose of freedom, we have, and then we, uh, we have to go to uh, the, the uh, next time the verb is used, elo, uh, the, uh, the, uh, elo three is used as a verb form, and it is the aorist active indicative. The aorist active indicative. This is a nomic aorist, aorist tense for that which is axiomatic and we call it a once and for all aorist. Again, remember the aorist tense does not indicate time except in the indicative mood. And in the indicative mood it is a time, has a time reference to it. And he is saying here that the uh, uh, we have once and for all and then the active voice, the subject produces the action of the verb. The subject here is Christ. It's uh, uh, the word that appears between what we've already looked at and the verb form, uh, Christos. And he is the one who, who makes possible our uh, fantastic freedom. And he produces the action of the verb. He once and for all freed us. And the indicative mood is declarative for a statement of dogmatic, emphatic fact that cannot be changed. For the purpose of freedom, Christ has freed us or set us free, uh, would be the best translation. Uh, uh, Dr. Wiest, in his uh, translation and uh, his commentary, says, uh, freedom does not refer to the kind of life we live. Remember, we go back to this matter of uh, uh, position and experience and uh, uh, everyone uh, is living in the area or the field of experience and they're failing to understand that all experience is based upon a position uh, and this is what he's uh, he brings out uh, freedom does not refer to the kind of life we live nor does it have reference to words or action but to the method by which we live our lives the Judaizers lived their lives in dependence upon self-support in an attempt to obey law. The Christian lives his life in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Their hearts have been occupied with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the details of life guided by the teaching of the apostles' doctrine. Now, in swinging over to the law, they were losing freedom and flexibility of self-determination coming from doing things right because it is right, because it pleases Jesus Christ, and because of love for Him. Here were people who had started out just fine. They had started out according to the principles of grace. They were born again by grace, and they started to live by means of grace. But something happens, and that is the coming of the Judaizers or the legalists. They arrive in town, the super apostles, the same ones who came to Corinth and caused so much trouble over there. And it caused these people to get sidetracked. And uh, they then began to try to uh, please God by means of energy of the flesh, i.e. circumcision. Beloved, this was a matter that was a problem throughout all of, the ch of church history, and it will, will always be a problem. There is absolutely no compatibility, no compromise between law and grace. The problem was true in, 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 the, in the letter to the Hebrews, where the author points out, instead of going back to circumcision as the Galatians, they were going back to temple worship in, in the book of Hebrews. But the same principle was, was uh, uh, in, in application. They had stopped their spiritual advance. Something had come in to cause them to stop where they were progressing. And that's what's brought out in Hebrews chapter 5, uh, the fantastic passage where the Apostle Paul begins to talk about, or pardon me, Paul didn't write Hebrews. The author of Hebrews begins to talk about the high priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he stops. And he begins in verse 11 of chapter 5 of Hebrews to say, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, not meaning that they had to be teachers as far as teaching classes, but teaching everyone from the information they had, by the time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of food, going back to the uh, basic uh, principles, going back to the, um, uh, he calls them, I'm looking for the Greek word here, uh, going back to, um, oh, I, I turned two pages, no wonder I didn't catch it, going back to the, uh, uh, picking up on uh, uh, the elementary truths of the stoichia is the word. That's what I was looking for. S-T-O-I-C-H-E-I-A. Stoichia is the basics, back to basics. It's the, uh, the, uh, uh, the rudiments. It's the, uh, the building blocks. It's, uh, by, by the time you ought to be teachers, you need uh, someone to teach you the basics. And then uh, regarding food, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And that's exactly what happened uh, to these people here. Uh, having begun uh, by means of grace, they were now seeking to be acceptable to God by means of their own human efforts. And so he uh, uses the illustration of uh, uh, Hagar and uh, Sarah to wake them up, and now he hits them uh, with this whole principle that is for the purpose of freedom that Christ has set us free, that we should not only be free from uh, human uh, efforts uh, in salvation, but free from human efforts in uh, advancing spiritually. And uh, uh, we'll be looking at the doctrine of freedom as a sub-doctrine under a doctrine in just a few minutes, but uh, let's move on with this verse. Now he gives them a command, the present active imperative from Stako. S-T-E-K-O. Stako. In the present active 
imperative form. Now, uh, steko means to, to stand, to take a stand, uh, um, to hold your ground. Uh, it, it also is used for uh, taking a stand on a principle. And that's how it's used here. This is a tendential present tense for an action which should be occurring but is not. They should be doing this, but they're not doing it because they have been... Uh, uh, what the next word is going to tell us about. They have been become entangled, uh, and as a result of this, uh, they have... Uh, 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 I don't even remember what the King James says anymore. I get so uh, in, in wrapped up in this. Uh, but they, they drifted off course from grace, is what the uh, Greek says. Um, many p times the people will look at the King James of this... Uh, I guess King James says they've fallen from grace. It's found in verse um, verse 4. You have fallen from grace, and they, people, they teach the whole body of doctrine that you can lose your salvation because you can fall from grace. But the word doesn't mean to fall at all, as you will see when we get down to it. Uh, take your stand on the grace principle. But they were not doing it. The tendential present tells us that they should be doing it, but they, they should be currently standing fast holding their ground on the principle of grace and freedom, but they are not. The active voice, the subject in this case, is the believer. The Lord Jesus Christ produced the action of the, the, uh, the giving us freedom, but the believer must uh, produce the action of standing fast on the principle of grace. And the imperative mood is a command from God, which has all the weight of any other command. Uh, in other words, he's saying if you live your life under grace and in the power of the Holy Spirit, you're free. If you live your life under legalism and energy of the f flesh, you are in bondage. And the bondage is to your old sin nature. And so keep on taking a permanent stand, therefore, for the once and for all freedom, which is the purpose of which Christ set us once and for all free. That's the paraphrase uh, this verse. I'll give it to you again. Keep on taking a permanent stand, therefore, for the once and for all freedom, which is the purpose for which Christ once and for all set us free. That's what the command is all about. And then we have the negative uh, side of this. The negative is may, M-E, which is the subjective negative, plus an echo. E-N-E-C-H-O. <clears throat> An echo means to be held within, to be ensnarled. <clears throat> it is used of those who are held physically in a net or those who are held ethically by a law or dogma or an emotion in which there is restriction which is placed upon one's freedom of movement so that they are not only uh, ensnared, but they are unable to... That's included in this meaning of this word <clears throat> and its usage. I beg your pardon. Unable to free oneself. This is a customary present tense, plus the negative, which tells you this, stop. Stop, be, and well, the passive voice is next, and that tells us that they receive the action of the verb. Uh, stop becoming entangled would be the way to translate it. See, they, they receive the action of the verb. Imperative mood. <coughs> A command to receive is stop being entangled. 
Now, please note something. We can stand fast, but we can do nothing to untangle ourselves from the bondage. The way we get out of the bondage is by going positive toward the freedom that automatically frees us from the gray, the, the, uh, uh, the entanglement. So, he says, uh, uh, for the purpose of freedom, take your stand. Take your stand uh, on the freedom that Christ has given to us to set us free. And t keep taking a stand on the principle of grace and freedom. And stop receiving entanglement or stop being entangled. And then he tells us with the uh, uh, zuge. Z-U-G-E. Zuge means to bring together two so that neither is free to move uh, without uh, movement from the other. Uh, it was used of the yoke the, that was uh, uh, constructed to hook uh, two oxen uh, uh, who would uh, pull uh, together on a plow or two, uh, uh, two asses. And uh, it is the same word which is used uh, in verb form when it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It simply means to bring two together so that neither is free to move without the other. And uh, so uh, here we have uh, uh, the uh, concept of grace and law or uh, uh, divine power, omnipotence, and human effort. You see? Uh, all right. So here is the yoke. And then we have the yoke of bondage. And the word for bondage is uh, this word, D-O-U-L-O-S, doulos. And doulos is the word for slavery. It's the word to become a slave. And uh, it is the yoke of slavery. But there's, uh, there's an also an interesting Greek construction here in which there is no definite article and uh, uh, w when there should be a definite article and there isn't, we can translate it uh, this way. Any yoke of slavery, whatever, whatever it may be that presents itself, whether it's in the case of these Galatians, the circumcision, or in the case of the Hebrew uh, church, uh, uh, would it, it would be perhaps going back to the uh, worship uh, uh, of the temple, but it could be any anything that brings the believer back under the yoke of bondage or the yoke of slavery. Uh, the believer has to be ever on the alert for the danger of being entangled again in some kind of legalistic operation in which uh, basically the opposite of grace is man by man's efforts, seeking the approbation of God, seeking to please God, seeking to impress God, seeking to cause God to do things for you on the basis of who and what you are or what you have done, or seeking to uh, advance in the Christian way of life because of what you grit your teeth and uh, accomplish by means of energy of the flesh. Now, he is going to talk about the futility of spirituality by works, beginning in verse 2. And he begins by saying, Behold. That's the way King James begins it. It is actually the imperfect of Idon, which looks like this. And it comes out, uh, Ide, and uh, it is... Uh, it means, uh, idon means to see, see, <laughs> see, so uh, it is, a, but, but in the imperative, it becomes uh, evocative. Now, uh, you'll notice that uh, New International translated, mark my words, and that's, that's translating it uh, as an idiom, but the Apostle Paul wants you to, to see something, uh, and we could say, get this straight. That might be the way we would use it in our, 
uh, idiom. Now get this straight. Uh, and uh, the Apostle Paul uh, says, I am uh, telling you something. Get this straight. I am telling, I'm going to straighten you out uh, very clearly. And, and here's how he begins with the word if. Now, if is a third class condition because it's aeon plus the subjunctive mood, which will uh, be uh, brought out in the word circumcised. Uh, the uh, the uh, pronoun is plural, so it's if you all. And then we have be circumcised, which is the present passive subjunctive from the Greek verb peritemno, looks like this. P-E-R-I-T-E-M-N-O, peritemno. Uh, peritemno just simply means to, to cut away, and it refers to the Jewish custom uh, of uh, circumcision uh, of the male. And uh, uh, it was a rite which identified the Jew. Now, the circumcision had many meanings, but it came to be absolutely meaningless as far as the original usage. Abraham's circumcision identified him as a believer, but it came to be passed on to all those who were Jews. And as a result of that, they, uh, uh, whether believer or unbeliever, they accepted the, uh, the circumcision. That's why the passive voice is used for the boy on the eighth day after his birth would receive circumcision. It has since been proven uh, by the medical profession that it is a, a very, something that the Jews knew long ago, though they didn't know why. God gave it to them way back when, and it's, it is really uh, a, a beautiful uh, a symbol, but it was also uh, excellent for health-wise. Anyway, uh, it was an identification as a Jew. And so what they were really saying is, uh, now you are a Christian, but uh, Christianity is just really a sect of Judaism, so you have to also identify yourself with Judaism, and so you need to be circumcised. And we'll see later on, Paul says, if you're going to be circumcised, then go all the way, become emasculated, but that's not the issue at this point. Uh, uh, so uh, this uh, uh, is, a, uh, is uh, a descriptive word for an action which is currently uh, uh, taking place. Uh, so uh, they, are cons- they, they were about to receive this uh, this uh, circumcision, this passive voice again, uh, they will receive something, but it's not grace in this case. It is a rite. It is a ritual which is absolutely uh, unnecessary as far as uh, the believer is concerned. And uh, uh, it is the subjunctive mood which tells us that it hasn't yet taken place uh, for the most part, although maybe with some it has. The point is you don't have to be circumcised it is going to be, be a volitional move. So he says, if, maybe you will and maybe you will not, receive circumcision, or you all is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, plural. If you all receive circumcision. Look, I'm telling you something, Paul says, and it's very important. If you all receive circumcision, Christ shall profit you nothing. The word for profit is... The word ophileo looks like this. The omega, O-P-H-E-L-E-O. Ophileo. Ophileo means uh, uh, to be aided, uh, to be benefited, to be helped. This is a future active indicative. Uh, the future tense is the tense of certainty. Of course, in this case, uh, we have uh, uh, O-U-D-E-N, uh, which is the negative. It negates it. 
uh, uh, and translated nothing. But the future indicative plus the negative tells us that it will never, there is never a time when this will be of benefit uh, uh, to you, uh, uh, that, that being, uh, if you are trusting in your own human effort, the production which is yours in Christ uh, will be never ever be of a benefit to you. If you submit yourself to the right of circumcision, you are placing yourself under the Mosaic Law, and thus you are depriving yourself of the ministry of God the Holy Spirit, which God has promised to those uh, who are united with Jesus Christ in His death, a retroactive positional truth, and in His resurrection, which is current positional truth. Now, there were times in the Old Testament in which the Holy Spirit came upon believers for service and left them when the service was finished, when the service was rendered. He did not indwell believers of the Old Testament for the purpose of setting them apart for God. They knew this and, and that it had nothing to do with their losing their salvation. It had to do with experience and living. Now, these believers were about to take themselves out from under the provision of God for the work of God is His work in the believer. It is absolutely, totally, and complete in itself. You, when you do something like placing yourself under the Mosaic Law, then you neutralize the work of Jesus Christ in you, and you render that work impossible. Now, we don't have the, the problem of people who are rendering themselves uh, rendering Christ uh, uh, profitless or benefitless or helpless to them as far as circumcision is concerned. But there are people who substitute other kinds of works, and mainly it is the operation of the old sin nature in its area of strength, allowing you, allowing your own effort to make you spiritual. Uh, it's uh, any work for salvation. Now, there are many uh, things which, which we, the believer, do that cannot be told, you cannot tell by looking at it from the outward appearance. That is going to be either one or the other. It's either going to be energy of the flesh, that is, energy of the old sin nature, or it is going to be the power of of the Holy Spirit. You take giving, for example. You can't tell by what a person gives, the size check they write. That, that will not tell you whether it's energy of the flesh or power of the Spirit. What's the difference? A person who gives with the wrong motivation is doing it energy of the flesh. A person who gives for the right motivation that is, because they are controlled by the Holy Spirit, because they love Jesus Christ, and they therefore want to uh, express their love by means of giving, then that is energy of the Spirit. And not what is done, but the power behind it, the motivation behind it. And it may be giving, it may be attendance at Bible class, it may be witnessing, it may be serving, Whatever it may be, it's, it depends upon the motivation. That's why uh, one of my uh, strong pushes always throughout the whole ministry of our church has been to always reiterate the fact that if you are doing anything because you have to do it, then it is the wrong motivation. And uh, that's why we don't push people into taking jobs. We'd rather have nothing. Now, according to our current uh, uh, situation, unless we have something take place, we will not be able to have the, uh, the Awana guards and uh, the pioneers next, this, next year because we do not have consistent leadership uh, for that, uh, that uh, area. We cannot continue to have it. We don't have the junior high program now because we don't have leadership, and we will not have grades 5 and 6 next year unless the Lord raises up some leadership. But uh, uh, nobody should ever feel any pressure 
to, uh, to take up leadership, to, uh, to teach a class or anything because of the fact that if I don't do it, nobody will do it. That is not the proper motivation. And if you do it with that motivation, it's energy of the flesh. And it's unacceptable to God. And it's just like being circumcised in order to please God, you see. It's, it's the same thing. It's just not acceptable to Him. And you really place yourself under a slavery situation. That job that you do becomes a slave situation. You go and you do that job, but you're doing it as a slave, not as a free man. The job is done, perhaps uh, nobody else can tell, but the job may be, may be uh, done as far as men are concerned. But when God under, looks at it, he says, this is not acceptable to me. And you are not enjoying it because you sense that you have to do it. If nobody else does it, I have to do it, you know. Or we won't have a class if I don't do it. I guess I'd better do it. And so we don't want that. No, it's better not to have it. Better not to have it because you feel like a slave and it doesn't profit anything. There is no benefit. There's no aid. There's no help at all. It is, it is worthless. And uh, so the antithesis, these two are antithetical to one another. Uh, and it's going to be all the way through this whole chapter, this principle is going to be brought out. Uh, uh, he says it again uh, in verse 3. Uh, I testify again. Here he uses the word marturomai. It looks like this. M-A-R-T-U-R-O-M-A-I. Marturomai, without an object... Uh, an objective accusative, uh, as it is here, means to protest. And uh, this is a dramatic present tense uh, in which the writer visualizes himself as being present. And so he says, I keep on protesting. I keep on protesting. The middle voice, uh, uh, and the middle voice is reflexive, I myself do it, and uh, the indicative is declarative again. I keep on uh, protesting. Uh, Paul is strong on this, and here is what he protests. Every man who is circumcised, uh, uh, it doesn't take place for women, but everyone who is circumcised. This is a present passive participle. Same word that we have already seen. Uh, peritemno. Everyone who receives passive voice, and again the potential pr present, everyone who receives circumcision. Then, what is the, the result? He is the present of Imi, present active indicative of Imi. This is a progressive present for an action in the state of persistence. In other words, anybody who steps back and says, I want to be circumcised, you just can't pick out certain parts of the Mosaic Law that you want to be under. You're under the whole thing. That's why I get a kick out of people who put up the Ten Commandments and say, these are the Ten Commandments, we need to do the Ten Commandments. Listen, if you place yourself under the Ten Commandments, you are under over 150 laws, which are included in the Mosaic Law. And that goes for everything from thou shalt have no other gods before me, all the way down to uh, the, the, some of the things that are related to uh, uh, eating of, uh, of pork and other things. And that's exactly what the Seventh-day Baptists have done, the Seventh-day Adventists, and a whole lot of other people who are uh, out in left field. They place themselves under the whole law. And that's exactly what Paul says. You keep on being debtor. And we, we have that same word again, uh, uh, a form of the word, of oh, we have a philo. O P H E I L O, which means uh, in the verb form to incur a, a debt 
or to owe something. You owe something. You are, you keep on being uh, in debt. You keep on owing. You keep on being bound to do something. It has the concept of, of binding, which, which hooks it up with the slavery issue. You keep on being in bondage to poieo, P-O-I-E-O, -E which is to do, to perform the aorist active infinitive form. And uh, the aorist tense is culminative aorist, meaning that in every point of time you are obligated or bound to keep or to do the whole law. I think the most beautiful illustration uh, is this. Suppose you are standing out in front of a, uh, of a plate glass window and you take a, a big rock and heave it at one corner of the plate glass window. What happens to the plate glass window? You don't just hit one corner of it. The whole thing shatters. And that's exactly what this is saying as far as if you go back and be circumcised, if you go back and start living your life under under obligation you are obligated to be entirely under uh, that law or you are to be you are a slave in all things in other words you are totally free in grace or you are totally a slave you don't have one foot in one and one in the other the believer is obligated to obey all or nothing at all an old song used to say that all or nothing at all. Suppose, let's take it and bring it up to it again. Suppose you go back and start observing the, uh, the Sunday as the Sabbath. That is observance of the Mosaic Law because there is no place in the New Testament where this is reiterated. Uh, and and uh, uh, the Colossian church was doing this. They were observing times and seasons, uh, days and months, times and years. The Colossian church was uh, going back uh, to uh, uh, the observation of uh, the new moons and, and uh, uh, the, the first uh, uh, day of every month in the Jewish calendar was a holiday or a, quote, holy day. And we have the same uh, concepts even today. People who uh, place themselves under the bondage of uh, uh, the, uh, the Lord's Day. Oh, they don't. They call it the Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath began on Friday evening and concluded on Saturday evening. So okay, there is no such thing. Well, it's a Christian Sabbath. There is no such thing as a Christian Sabbath. Okay, and so they call it the Lord's Day. And uh, uh, as the Lord's Day, uh, you don't do certain things. And uh, the legalist places himself under those things. But whatever it may be, uh, the point is you are either free and entirely free, or you are a slave and entirely a slave. And then he adds this magnificent statement in verse 4, Christ is become of none effect whosoever is justified by the works of the law. He is fallen from grace. Well, we need not only to correct the translation, but we need to correct the order of the words from the Greek. And it begins with the words of no effect. And there's a word that we will become acquainted with again when we come to Romans 6.4. It looks like this in the Greek. K-A-T-A-R-G-E-O. Kat Argeo. Kat Argeo means to be rendered ineffective. It means to be rendered neutral or neutralized. It means to become unproductive. It means to become ineffectual or uh, impotent. It means to become inactive. All of these are various shades of meaning of kat 
Hargeo. Uh, I think the first two that I have listed are the most uh, comprehensive. It really deals with everything. To be neutralized. Neutralized means there is, it has a absolutely no effect. No effect whatsoever. If you neutralize the enemy, you make it so the enemy does not have any uh, effect upon you. Uh, you neutralize acid, the acid no longer does what the acid is intended to do. I guess when ladies, uh, uh, I've read this or I've seen it, ladies uh, use color on their hair. I wonder what would happen if you didn't neutralize the color after X number of, of minutes that it's on there. Uh, you know, uh, what would be the case? When I start dyeing my hair, then I'll find out uh, all about that. Uh, but... Uh, the idea is to render inoperative. I used the illustration the other evening of uh, uh, taking uh, the uh, and, and moisture getting inside of the uh, the distributor cap. Uh, it renders it absolutely neutral, and that's what he is saying here: uh, of no effect or uh, neutralized. This is an aorist passive. Indicative, again, aorist indicative it goes back to tell us that uh, in the point of time that you place yourself under some kind of legalism, you make something happen in your life. The passive voice, uh, you receive uselessness. You receive neutralization. You receive it because it comes as an automatic uh, uh, res result and therefore here's the point anything that you do for Jesus Christ from the moment of time you become a slave is absolutely worthless and wasted it is absolutely as if it didn't occur at all this is a fantastic principle totally without effect without influence without a uh, lasting uh, reward or anything like that. Then we have the preposition of ultimate source, apo, A-P-O, from the source of Christ. Whosoever, the, prepos uh, the uh, preposition, the pronoun hostis, H-O-S, T-I-S, the nominative plural, believers involved in this uh, turning away from their freedom uh, to some kind of legalism. They are the ones who are useless from the ultimate source of Jesus Christ. The point is that by putting themselves under any kind of legalistic obligation to the flesh, they are under obligation to live their whole lives by means of the flesh. And in so doing, they quench and grieve the Holy Spirit and as a result of this, they have uh, cut themselves off from the only power available to live the Christian way of life. And uh, they make themselves useless as far as the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned. And so we'll pick this up after, uh, after our break and uh, continue to find out what it means to be fallen from grace. Thank you, Father, for your matchless grace. May God the Holy Spirit help us to... I appreciate these things I ask in Jesus' name.